What is a mainframe? Do people still use them? I just used the mainframe. In fact, most banks use them because they do a lot of data-intensive batch processing and online transaction processing. Now, when I talk about a mainframe in these videos, please note that I'm talking about an IBM Z system server. The two types of mainframe workloads are batch processing processes a lot of data in a short amount of time. Batch jobs do their work and produce things like end of day reports and billing statements. Online transaction processing is typically a short interaction between a user and the system. For example, an ATM transaction, or when you use your debit or credit card at the supermarket. We want our money where we want to pay, and we want it done fast. So we know a lot of banks use mainframes, 96 out of the world's top 100. While we're at it, nine out of the top 10 global life and health insurance providers. Here's a few other fun facts found during recent surveys. So, are mainframes going to be around for a while? That's a slam dunk. Now that we've gotten past the myth that mainframes are dead, what kind of mainframe jobs are out there? Mine happens to be that of a system programmer. The system programmer takes care of the operating system, ZOS in this case. They upgrade it and optimize it. They plan and implement hardware and software system upgrades. They automate operations and are involved in day-to-day -day troubleshooting, helping app developers, looking up return codes, or applying fixes to the system software. Some mainframe shops also have system programmers who specialize in particular middleware products, such as CICS and DB2. The application programmer designs and develops application software for the company's users and customers. These are the coders, and yes, we're often talking about COBOL, but Java and C, C++ have become popular as well. The system operator monitors system consoles for unusual conditions, like error messages, and they work with the system programmers to keep things running smoothly. They also monitor batch processing. Let's talk about the primary ways you can interface with ZOS. TSO, ISPF, and Unix. TSO provides a basic command prompt interface to ZOS. Having a TSO logon ID and password is how you initially log on to the system. This is an example of a splash screen used to log on to TSO. I'll type LTSO, enter my TSO ID and password. And you'll see I am immediately directed to a panel-driven interface, ISPF. ISPF. This is where most of the magic happens. If for some reason ISPF is broken, you can issue basic commands to ZOS via TSO. But that's not something you want to do just for kicks. ISPF is basically your interface to the mainframe. From here you can use 3.4 to locate, browse, and edit datasets. My user ID is already filled in. I'll find any data sets with that high level qualifier. B will browse a data set. E will edit a data set. Now I'll use PF3 to back out to the primary option menu. The last interface to ZOS that I want to mention is Unix. It's comprised of a kernel, the shell interface, and a file system, an HFS or ZFS. One way to invoke the shell is through an ISPF panel-driven interface, iShell. Issuing the TSO command iShell brings it up. From here you can work with file systems by selecting file systems up top. The mount table shows you what's currently mounted and gives you options like unmounting them or displaying attributes. Looking in the USR directory, we can find what version of Java is installed.
That was a quick introduction to ZOS and the mainframe. You won't want to miss the next video in this series called JCL and SDSF. I'm going to demonstrate submitting a batch job and begin working on a program to find out what your garbage pail kit name is. I know what mine are and there are plenty. Don't know what the hell I'm talking about? Then please stay tuned and find out.